1866, Helen Beatrix Potter's early life resembled that of most high-class Victorian women, in that it was exceptionally boring. Restricted as she was by the ideals of Victorian society and her parents, Beatrix lived a fairly lonely and sheltered life that was made bearable largely thanks to her hobbies. She raised animals, studied nature and fungi, learned to draw and paint, and eventually wrote and illustrated her own children's books, a fact which you're probably aware of considering her books have sold over a hundred million copies worldwide. Beatrix's success in an era where women were confined to the home is impressive on its own, but factoring in her tragic love affair, it's honestly surprising that her life didn't receive a film adaptation until 2006. But is Miss Potter historically accurate? Let's take a look and find out. Despite a few changes and omissions, the film provides a fairly accurate outline of Beatrix Potter's early life. Details such as the Potter's summer vacations in the Lake District, Beatrix's Scottish nanny with her love of fairy stories, and Beatrix and her brother's fascination with animals and nature paint a fairly accurate outline of her early childhood. Also, in addition to referencing the pets that inspired Beatrix's stories, such as Peter Rabbit and the mice Tom Thumb and Hunkamunka, the film also includes a reference to one of Beatrix's earlier illustrations. While watching her parents leave to attend a party, young Beatrix imagines that their coach is a pumpkin pulled by a team of giant rabbits. This scene is remarkably similar to an illustration that Beatrix penned in the 1890s, which depicts Cinderella's pumpkin coach being pulled by a team of giant rabbits. Moving forward about 20 years, the movie depicts the publication of The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Frederick Warnenko and gives us a fairly accurate glimpse into Beatrix's home life as a 30-something unmarried woman living with her very by the book Victorian parents. The Warren Brothers' less than enthusiastic response to Beatrix's first book and their decision to dump the project on their younger brother Norman is accurate as is Norman's genuine fascination with Beatrix's stories and illustrations. As in real life, the success of The Tale of Peter Rabbit prompts the publication of several more books, and sparks a close relationship between Beatrix and Norman, which ends with the latter proposing marriage. However, Beatrix's parents, especially Helen, are unwilling to let their daughter marry a tradesman, and reject Norman's proposal. Beatrix, not willing to take her parents' bigotry lying down, counters their argument by explaining that, as their wealth is derived from trade, they are essentially no better than Norman Warren and his family. While it's true that both Rupert and Helen derive the bulk of their money from trade, Helen from the John Leach Company of Cotton Merchants and Rupert from his father's printing company, even more ironic is the fact that Rupert Potter was himself a tradesman, as he studied and received a law degree, though it seems he never actually put it to use. Apparently, Victorian high society considers laziness a passable trait if you also happen to be incredibly wealthy. Unlike today, where everyone earns their fortune through hard work and determination, Unfortunately, while vacationing with her parents, Beatrix receives a letter from Norman's sister, informing her that he's fallen ill. Beatrix races back to London, only to find that Norman has passed away. While Norman's death in the film may seem a bit abrupt, the real Norman Warren died just one month after proposing to Beatrix. Not that surprising, considering lymphatic leukemia was virtually impossible to treat before the discovery of chemotherapy. Grief-stricken and sick of her parents, Beatrix decides to leave London and move to the Lake District, buying and renovating Hilltop Farm to serve as her new home. While at Hilltop, Beatrix meets Mr. William Helis, a local solicitor who assists her in the pursuit of her new hobby, buying and preserving farmland. While the working relationship between William and Beatrix did eventually blossom into a romance, the film decides not to depict this, 
choosing instead to insert a text dump before the end credits. Said text dump explains that Beatrix and William were married eight years after Beatrix moved to the Lake District, and that before her death, Beatrix donated over 4,000 acres of land to the National Trust, helping to preserve the Lake District for future generations. A successful children's author and a conservationist, I guess some people are just overachievers. While the film provides a fairly accurate outline of Beatrix Potter's life, or at least her early to late 30s, a lot of small details are changed or omitted entirely. In the film, Beatrix calls her younger brother Bertram a barbarian as he enjoys collecting and impaling, I mean preserving, insects. This is ironic as Beatrix actually shared her brother's love of collecting and cataloging animals, both as pets and as specimens. While both Bertram and Beatrix had a number of pets, including a porcupine, a pair of bats, lizards, mice, and even a rout of snails, when these beloved pets passed away, their bodies would sometimes be preserved and stored inside their collector's cabinet. This large cabinet, which they kept on the third floor of their home in Number 2 Bolton Gardens, was filled to the brim with skeletons, preserved beetles, moss, butterflies, stones, shells, and even fossils. As someone who grew up with Beatrix Potter, I always imagined her as a kind and creative soul that loved animals, but now I associate her with my skeletons and taxidermy. She was also apparently fairly proficient at butchering pigs, which makes reading the tale of Pigling Bland a very different experience. Beatrix wrote an early draft of the tale of Peter Rabbit in a letter she sent to Noelle Moore, the child of her former governess Annie Moore. Beatrix apparently liked the story so much that she decided to write another letter for Noelle's brother Eric about a frog named Jeremy Fisher. While these stories were crafted specifically to entertain Noelle and Eric, their mother loved the stories and urged Beatrix to try and get them published, which she did eight years later. Just like in the film, the tale of Peter Rabbit was rejected numerous times before Frederick, Warren, and Co. agreed to publish it in 1901. What the movie fails to mention, however, is that after numerous rejections, Beatrix decided to self-publish The Tale of Peter Rabbit. Determined to see her book in print, Beatrix commissioned Stangway and Sons to print over 400 copies of The Tale of Peter Rabbit, selling them to friends, family members, and anyone who'd take a copy. A bit like selling Girl Scout cookies now that I think about it. Beatrix's career as a saleswoman was cut short when Frederick Warren and Co. were persuaded to publish The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Hardwick Ronsley, a friend of Beatrix's family whose contributions are cut out of the film entirely. The second of Beatrix's stories to be published by Frederick Warren and Co. was The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin in 1903, not The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck as the movie suggests. Interestingly enough, The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin was preceded by another book that Beatrix self-published, called The Tailor of Gloucester, which was published by Ward & Co. the same year as The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. Beatrix had a very high turnout during her first few years as an author. It seems boredom is a very good motivator. Norman's proposal in the film is decidedly more romantic, as he proposes to Beatrix in person, rather than by letter. Yes, you heard right, Norman Warren proposed to Beatrix by letter. While this may seem like the Victorian equivalent of proposing to someone by text message, due to the restrictions of the age, Beatrix and Norman were never allowed to be alone together, and letters provide the only means for them to communicate privately. Beatrix also sent a reply by mail, so I would imagine poor Norman spent more than a few nerve-wracking hours worrying about her reply. At least now, people have the option of being rejected in person. The Christmas story that Beatrix writes for Norman is also a film edition, though the painting is a Beatrix Potter original. Rabbit's Christmas Party Roasting Apples is part of a set of four narrative paintings, depicting a group of rabbits having, you guessed it, a Christmas party. 
While these paintings were never intended to be part of a book, they have now been compiled into a frieze which you can purchase off Amazon, because anything related to Beatrix Potter can be exploited for money. Beatrix, unfortunately, never lived at Hilltop Farm full time, as she was frequently called back to London to care for her parents and help run Bolton Gardens. Despite the film's claims to the contrary, it seems that the real-life Rupert and Helen Potter had fairly selfish motives for refusing their daughter's claims to independence, as they expected her, as an unmarried woman of almost 40, to take care of them and their estate. When Beatrix married William Helis in 1913, the couple decided to move into the slightly larger Castle Cottage, though Beatrix maintained Hilltop, turning it into an art studio. Bertram Potter's marriage to Mary Scott, the daughter of a wine merchant, is referenced in the film, though not the fact that Bertram kept his marriage a secret for 11 years. Bertram married Mary Scott in secret in Edinburgh in 1902, and only came clean to his parents in an effort to convince them that William Helis was a suitable match for his sister. I guess he figured that if his parents were going to excommunicate Beatrix, the least he could do was come clean and go down with her. In the film, after moving to the Lake District, Beatrix reconnects with Willie Helis, an old childhood friend, or so the film would have us believe. There's no evidence that Beatrix Potter and William Helis were ever childhood friends. This is supported by the fact that Rupert and Helen Potter didn't allow their children to fraternize with anyone outside their social class. The film also alters Helis' background, as rather than the son of a groundsman like in the film, the real William Helis came from a long line of Anglican priests. Though, just like in the film, William decided to break with tradition and became a lawyer. The relationship between Beatrix Potter and William Helis started as a business affair, as Beatrix hired Helis and his law firm to help her coordinate her land dealings in the Lake District. This is decidedly less romantic than the film's interpretation, but if you've learned anything from this video, you know that dating in the Victorian era was complicated. Beatrix lived another 38 years after moving to the Lake District, and as summarizing the rest of her life and accomplishments would take more time than I want to spend on this video, I encourage you to pick up one of Beatrix Potter's many biographies if you want to find out more about her. As always, I must ask you to please remember to support your local library, and stay safe out there everyone.